All week, and for good reason, we've been talking about the latest racial controversy for President Trump. We've been playing the clips and showing you the tweets. Well, our next guest says all of this is a deliberate political strategy, and here's a, a bit of the piece that she just wrote for Salon. Quote, Donald Trump thinks white nationalism is going to win him the 2020 election. Trump thinks it's a winning move to echo the claims of David Duke and other white nationalists who believe the United States is for white people. But if you look at some new numbers from USA Today, the majority of those asked say they're against the president on this. Two-thirds of those say that telling minority Americans to go back where they came from is a racist statement. And 59% say the president's tweets are, quote, un-American. Senior politics writer for Salon, Amanda Marcotte, joins us now. Amanda, you've been writing about President Trump's attacks on Democratic members of Congress. The if you don't like it, you can leave uh, lines where he's pretty obviously trading in racism and xenophobia. You've also been writing that this is a specific strategy on his part. What, what is that strategy? How does it, in theory, get him to 270 electoral votes? Well, I think a lot of it is that he won in 2016 by running on a openly racist white identity politics campaign, and he thinks he can do it again. But I think even more so he's convinced of it because he's addicted to Fox News TV. He watches it every day and every night. And it, ever since he got elected, they've been ramping up the white nationalist inflected rhetoric, especially on Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram's show. So I think he really has it in his head that the way to win in 2020 is to lean into, frankly, white nationalist rhetoric. And he's just on a feedback loop with Fox News that tells him every day and night that that's the correct move to take. But that white nationalist approach and that listening to Fox News seemed to work for him in 2016. If it worked for him three years ago, why wouldn't it work next year? Well, I mean, I think in 2016 we had two different things going on. First of all, he won, you know, truly a black swan event. It was only 80,000 votes in three states, swing states, that could very well swing in the other direction. Second of all, I think a lot of people that voted for him just simply didn't like Hillary Clinton and weren't really necessarily paying a lot of attention to Donald Trump outside of the fact that he was a TV star on The Apprentice and things like that. And since then, I think who he really is has become more evident to a lot of people. And third, I would say the approval ratings show that every time Donald Trump leans into this kind of overtly racist rhetoric, his approval ratings go down and they go into the 30s. And while incumbents do have an advantage, it's pretty hard to win an election when your approval rates are in the 30s or low 40s. President Trump supporters would say, and some are saying, that he's just engaging in identity politics, much as Democrats have done and that Democratic presidential candidates are doing right now. How would you respond? I've never heard an identity politics per, like candidate, which is, you know, a slur used to demonize female candidates who express feminism, people of color candidates who express anti-racism. I have never once heard them say that men should leave the country, that white people should leave the country. I've never seen anybody that is called an identity politics politician uh, straight up treat people that look differently as if they're less equal. And I think that that's the, the big difference here. I think Trump is basically positing that white men are better than everybody else, whereas all these other people just want everyone else to be equal to white men. If this is an election strategy for the president, wouldn't that nationalist approach help rally his base and boost turnout and possibly help him win another four years, especially in those states that you were talking about where the margins were raised or thin in the industrial Midwest, where you had lesser educated white voters who flipped from Obama to Trump. There's a real fear that playing to race will play to those voters. It's one of the reasons why so many Democrats think Joe Biden gives them the best chance in 2020, because it mitigates the race issue. It's dark and wouldn't it be a potentially effective approach? I think it could work. I mean, I don't want to be a Pollyanna about this. There's no doubt that among certain white voters in the Midwest and the South, um, they were more willing to vote in 2016 because of Trump's overt racism. And obviously, I think those same voters are going to be motivated again in 2020. I don't know if he's going to add voters to that voter toll. And I would also say that it's not helpful to think of mitigating the race issue because Racist voters aren't just about the candidates that are at the top of the ticket. They are also going to think about the people that are behind the candidate, the fact that the Democratic coalition is racially diverse, where the Republican coalition is not. 
That's what motivates them. I don't care what face you put at the top of the ticket. And if it is Joe Biden at the front of the ticket, then Trump is just going to continue to bash Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Elon Omar, Ayanna Presley, and Rashida Tlaib, no matter what, because he wants to make this about race. And so he's never going to let you forget that the Democratic coalition is racially diverse either. All that said, I don't think that there's going to be more voters for Trump. And that's what he's probably going to need in order to fight back against the fact that the Democratic politicians, the Democratic base is going to be highly motivated as well. There's another possibility, Amanda, that may be playing out alongside that nationalism strategy. The four members of the squad who you just mentioned are self-identified Democratic socialists. And poll shows that Americans are afraid of a socialist president, so that essentially their ethnicities are less important to Trump than being able to peg them and, by extension, the entire party as socialist or just other. Thoughts? My main thought is that the word socialist is fairly meaningless as an actual ideological descriptor in our society. Um, it's been used and it's traditionally been used as coded language for racial, racist politics in this country, and it has been for a long time. Um, I think that some people are afraid of the word socialist, and they don't really know that, but the majority of people that I think are provoked by the word socialist, um, there's a very racialized understanding of that word that is driving this. So I don't think those things are inseparable. You really think so? Because in, I'm just thinking to the last Democratic debate where you had just about every candidate who was talking about you know, public health insurance and eliminating private insurance. That's a move towards socialism or a more socialist uh, agenda item that scared the you know what out of a lot of people who watched. And that was espoused by Democrats regardless of their race or ethnicity. Yeah. And I think, um, again, you can't separate that from race. I don't think at all, because just as you see in England that has a socialized health care system far more than anything that is being proposed by the Democrats now, it was completely non-controversial until they had large amounts of immigration into England uh, that changed the racial diversity of that country. And all of a sudden, people started getting fussy about the socialized health care system and how it's working. I think ultimately what people who don't like the word socialism or don't like the idea of, say, public health care insurance are saying when they say they don't like socialism is they are saying they don't want to share the public good with people that look different than they do. Trump in some ways got the oxygen to attack those four members because of their conflicts with Nancy Pelosi. Does Pelosi need to rethink her approach to the squad? Does her trying to downplay their influence actually give them more influence and hurt Pelosi's efforts? Um, I don't know that it's bad that they have influence, but I definitely think that Nancy Pelosi needs to quit picking fights with them. I recognize that she, I feel like she's playing an old school politics where she takes all the heat for moderate members of her caucus that don't feel that they can move for impeachment, that don't feel like they can embrace Medicare for all, for all these other things that they can't embrace. And so she picks these public fights so that she's the face of the moderation that she may not even actually vote for, right? But I think it's not helping because it's creating these kinds of situations that Donald Trump can inject himself into and, and further racialize and, and stigmatize the situation. And I, um, I think she should probably practice a different kind of politics that involves saying less divisive things about her own Cox members. Finally, Amanda, if you, were, if you thought what the president said was racist, you probably weren't likely to vote for him anyway. So how do Democrats convert this outrage to votes? And is this enough to motivate people who stayed home last time or voters who flipped from Obama to Trump to come back into the Democratic fold? Well, the number of people that sat out, that voted for Obama and then sat out the next election far exceeds the number of people that voted for Obama and then Trump. So it is a really a turnout issue, and especially with more young voters, um, potential young voters. We have this millennial generation. They're a lot bigger than the Gen X before them. If all of them registered to vote and voted, uh, this would be a non-issue. <laughs> Uh, I don't think a Republican could win the presidency again, honestly. I, I think it is a turnout issue more than anything, and I do think that Trump's racism was treated as something of a joke by a lot of people, unfortunately, in 2016, and they don't think it's a joke any longer. And I think that that could make a real difference in who turns up on the polls on 2020. Amanda Marcotte is the senior politics writer at Salon. Amanda, thanks for Skyping with us. Thanks for having me. Up next, exactly 50 years ago tonight, the Apollo 11 astronauts were on their way from the Earth to the moon. After the break, we'll speak with an astrophysics professor about the incredible achievement 
and what we learn from it.